Welcome to the MSP Dumpster Fire series. This is season one, the impact AI will have on your MSP. Welcome back, everybody, to episode two of our series, AI Dumpster Fire. Uh, we're here today uh, to talk about what AI is and what it is not. But before we get there, a quick introduction. I'm Robert Chiaffi, the CTO and co-founder of Progressive Computing, an MSP based in Yonkers, New York. And I'm joined by my friend, Alex. I'm Alex Farling. I'm the chief noisemaker over here at Empath, uh, where we're building some education software for MSPs and maybe building the only product in the world that isn't powered by AI yet. Oh, boy. Um, and you know what? I love that title, Noisemaker. I think of like yeah. uh, New Year's with like one of those sticks with the weird. I had to fight Wes for that title because uh, because he's so good at it, but he was too busy trying to be a dictator. So, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, what AI is and what it is not. I mean, we talked about the history in the last episode, which kind of, you know, got us to here today. But I think there's a lot of confusion about what AI is and what it is not. What do you think AI is? Uh, is what's your influence there, Alex? Well, you know, I've watched a lot of TV, and mm -hmm. um, I've got some opinions, probably poorly formed <laughs> ones. But I'm really okay. worried that uh, that that I can't yet talk to my watch and get my car to come pick me up. But I think we're close. Like if I have Tesla, maybe that's a thing. Maybe. Um, but 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 Knight Rider comes to mind, right? There's some good mm -hmm. good AI Kit. technology. Yeah. Um, but but I'm like everybody else. Like I watched a lot of Terminator. Like is, is are we building Skynet here? Yeah, uh, there, and there's that, a lot to unpack here. That's the recurring joke, right? You know, is Skynet. Is, is it a joke or, yeah. or is it foreshadowing? Uh, well, I think uh, we actually hit the in the movies the date already that Skynet was supposedly supposed to go <laughs> online. Um, so is it here yet? Um, uh, no. So I'm not a medical doctor, Alex, but I know one particular ailment that people suffer from. And so I'm going to give you my diagnosis. And that is that you uh -oh. are suffering from what I call the Hollywood syndrome. You've watched way too much television and your brain is distorted about the way the world really works. Now, for those of us in IT, and I'm talking about normal IT, not advanced stuff like AI or cutting edge stuff like that, uh, but just the basic IT stuff, right? How many of us have seen movies or television shows and say to ourselves, that's not the way it works <laughs> uh, until it is yeah. right. Right. I, I, we've, we look at how Hollywood has predicted technology, you know, all the way back to the star Trek communicator, right. Which became well, my, my star tack that I flipped yeah. open and talked on the phone with. Right. Um, so, so there's always that little bit of is Hollywood going there? Uh, is Hollywood just leading the pack and setting, setting the minds of the, of the people who are building the technology, giving them ideas to yes. build the next thing or do, you know, trip the next lever. Um, what, so what's your art, feeling? Art, like you've, you've done yeah, some homework on this. Our art can certainly um, influence, you know, the direction of science. But let's talk about some of those classic Hollywood uh, examples of things of what AI is not. Right? It's not the typical Terminator, especially when you know all of his uh, organic uh, exterior features are revealed, and all you just see this uh, metallic skeleton with the red eyes. Right? It, that's not AI, at least not any time in our lifetimes, at least my belief. It's not um, awesome movies like iRobot, right? Very entertaining, yeah. uh, very uh, thought provoking, but that's not it. Uh, one of my classic favorites, right? Space Odyssey 2001. It's not, um, it's not HAL, right? Um, yeah. uh, anticipating Dave's maneuvers on, you know, on the ship and, you know, manipulate, and it's not manipulative in that way. It's not the matrix. Right. It's not one of my favorite, which you mentioned, I am a huge Trekkie, right? And so one of my all time favorite characters, definitely probably in my top three is data, right? It's not there you go. an Android walking around and acting like a human. Um, and another movie that I just watched recently, I couldn't help myself. Uh, I had a couple hours to uh, burn on a weekend, which is super rare for me, but I ended up watching um, War Games, right, with young Matthew Broderick. Oh, God, right? that goes back a ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Right. Greetings, Professor Falcon. You know, shall we play a game, right? And yeah. I was mesmerized by rewatching this movie because it was so awesome. I just, I really like, uh, um, uh, I just really love the movie. Uh, anyway, so those are 
uh, Hollywood's examples of... Well, you left off Hollywood's one of Hollywood's most recent examples and one that spanned oh, yeah. a whole series. Let's not forget about Jarvis and, and um, the, oh, the yeah. Tony Stark movies, right? Uh, uh, as we, as we get into Avengers. Uh, and you know what? I, I'm sure we're probably missing because in my original... Dozens, list, dozens right? Yeah, there's but, dozens. Um, but that one sticks out to me about, because, yeah. you know, at one point you had a good AI fighting a bad AI. And I don't think, uh, you know, that's very Hollywood. It's very Hollywoodized, if you will. But I don't right. think, and we'll talk to, to some security experts later in this series. I don't think we're that far off. I think there comes a day where good AI fights bad AI. Uh, right. Maybe not to that level. Well, maybe not at a super intelligence level. And we're going right. to talk about some of the terms and super that's intelligence term. uh, is... Um, uh, one of the uh, terms to know when we navigate AI, and it's intentionally on our list at the bottom, right? Because we're just not there yet, right? Um, but so I, as I was doing my research, uh, and reminder for everybody, right? We're not subject matter experts here, but we're just uh, some people who are passionate about this topic and uh, learning on this journey. And we'll have some guests that will join us over time to lend their knowledge, experience, and expertise. Um, but one quote that I, I uh, wrote down, which I'm trying to remember who said it, but um, somebody said, we're a long way off in terms of AI achieving super intelligence, but that does not mean that a, a long way off does not mean a long time, <laughs> right? And uh, right. when we are talking about the history, and so here's a classic example of why studying the history of any real topic is so important to understand where we are and where we're going is uh, remember that we went through the AI winter and, you know, throughout the 1970s, uh, 80s, 90s, mainly in the 2000s, it yeah. started to really heat up. And why? Because we didn't have the computing power uh, at normal everyday uh, fingertips, right? It was reserved for very, very few uh, either corporations with limited budgets for things like this and just really wasn't explored. But now think about the computing power. I mean, shoot, my calculator has more processing power than the computer used to put a man on the moon. Um, right. So, you know, Moore's Law states in layman's terms that the processing power of microchips doubles every two years while the cost is halved. And while that is slowing down and there's evidence to suggest Moore's Law is reaching some... Um, uh, uh, constraints, uh, limits yeah. right, or constraints. Yeah. Um, for the for the most part, it's still holding true these days, right? Things are just getting crazier, faster, better, right? And so the available processing power of hardware is really what's driving the advances in all this tech in all technology, right? Not yeah. just AI, uh, but certainly has helped accelerate uh, AI's capabilities. So. Um, we've got to be really careful before we go down this road of what AI is. We understand what it is not. And this will also this also serves as a primer for some later discussions in future episodes around like fears and managing change and understanding things like privacy and confidentiality. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different things where what AI is and what it is not and how it affects or shapes those conversations and discussions. I think that's super important, and you know we can we can dive into to some of the more, most recent stuff that's landed in the news, and it may not be quite so recent by the time we drop all these podcasts. But there's been conversations in the news about you know China not allowing Intel and AMD chips, where you know in the U.S. we tend to ban some Chinese technology. And is right. there a world where the competition for the best AI relies on the best hardware? Um, right. I think that's an interesting conversation that we we may have to weave into this somewhere. Um, but I think the hardware limit helps define what is and is, what AI is and is not today and what it can become in the future. And those who have the access to the best hardware that scales the fastest, that, that can perform all these, um, all this, all this compute on the chip it, are the ones who are going to win. Um, you know, being able to do this in your pocket without sending it out to the cloud seems like the, the, the huge win and the thing that makes it just as fast as can be. I totally agree there, Alex. And if we were to put our, um, you know, if we were to, uh, think about the future, right? Put on our future goggles here for a moment. You know, what could help accelerate Moore's law, um, you know, by bringing it into exponential growth other than the slowing pat, you know, meaning the reverse of the slowing pattern and quantum computing is potentially the next thing to really drive uh, AI uh, in leaps and bounds uh, uh, forward. 
uh, that we don't have today. But again, quantum computing still in its infancy, uh, still very difficult, still very experimental, still very laboratory based. And still um, very, very expensive, right? It's, uh, it's cost prohibitive expensive. at any you know, scale. It was years ago, I remember being at, um, uh, of all things, a Microsoft Worldwide Partner Conference. And I was in one of those arenas, probably like a basketball arena, where they had 15, 20,000 attendees. And they had like their chief scientist uh, on stage with, um, I, I'm not even sure who it was. Maybe it was their CFO at the time or their CEO. Uh, and it was really interesting the way this guy was talking about how the technology that's in our pockets, right? So if you look at your modern smartphone and you think about um, just the ubiquity of that, right? The, the universal availability of that. Everybody's got one in their pockets and our expectations of what they do or their capabilities is it's just, it's our reality, right? But if you go back in time 20 years ago, that same technology actually existed, but it existed only in laboratories. And that was the point that this scientist, their chief scientist was making. And it really kind of changed or altered my thinking about uh, our technology curves. There are the things that we will be using uh, or taking for granted as everyday normal things 20 years from now exist today, but they exist only in laboratories. Very large, unwieldy, super expensive, hard to use, but they exist, right? Now yep. it's just a question of uh, being able to mass produce them and bring the costs down. And, and that's um, the same. I mean, in our last episode, we talked about, you know, the original artificial intelligence computers built by IBM and stuff. They were the size of a tractor trailer. Today, you have that much processing power in your iPhone. And so yeah. there's just examples of this everywhere you look in history where as technology becomes accessible to people, it's because it's cheaper and smaller and, and manages to, to make its way into the home. Yep. So Alex, I think um, we can round out this conversation on this, you know, the, the back half of this. We talked about what AI isn't, right? Or yeah. what it isn't actually, at least by today, today 2024, yeah. right? Uh, I would even venture 25, maybe even 2026. We're not there. Right. Uh, don't expect Terminator to appear, uh, uh, teleport in your backyard anytime soon. Um, but so I now think it's time that we start talking a little bit about what AI is, um, because there's a lot of focus on what it's not. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. If you don't mind, um, a, um, I in my research, what I discovered was that AI is simply the simulation of human intelligence by machines, but I want to key on a very, very important word there. It's simulation, right? It's this mimicry that gets people into thinking uh, 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 immediately about their fears about, oh my goodness, it's going to take over the world. It's going to take over my job. It's going to do this. It's like, you know, it's just going to take everything over. It's a simulation, right? Of human intelligence by machines. It's not intelligence. It's the simulation of that. So that was one of the first definitions that I found. Um, the second thing is that AI is specifically designed software, right? It's code, just like we'd write any other program uh, that learns by ingesting and analyze very large amounts of data. So um, what another way I say this is we think about AI as just like some really like slick programming that somebody has figured out how to uh, essentially like create a brain, right? Well, we've all heard the stories about two AIs in a lab that develop their own language and start to talk to each other, right? Um, yeah. But nobody, and when they tell that story, nobody backs up to say, well, this is how much information we fed that AI. Well, thank before you. Before it was able to digest that and get yeah. to a point where it even knew what a language was and could could create its own and, and talk to a counterpart. Um, and, and so the news wants to scare us with all that, with all the, the big, scary AIs coming to life. In reality, um, you know, probably petabytes of data and years go into training that system so that it can get smart enough to do something like that. So it's that super slick software or coding plus data and not just, and I don't mean to make those things sound equal because they're not, because like you said, uh, you referenced petabytes, you know, uh, we're talking about tremendously large data sets, right? You can't just feed AI a picture of uh, three cats and for it for suddenly now to be able to discern what's a cat and what's not. Right. So uh, but it's the coding's ability to learn and ingest that data 
and then um, use it to figure out um, whether something is is something or is not something, right? Uh, it, it can learn, right? And AI is really good uh, at looking at correlations and patterns um, and then use that data to make predictions. So what I mean by this is if you were, if I were to give you, Alex, a database, a, a database of, um, let's say, um, different combinations of ingredients uh, that go into making a perfume, right? Um, there might be, mathematically speaking, billions of combinations, right? Now, as a uh, professional sniffer, and yes, there, there, there are those jobs out there, right? People who uh, can smell something and discern whether or not that smells good or doesn't smell good or what combination of things work. Um, AI can look at that data, right, and process that and make really, really good predictions about what combinations might, um, uh, uh, might yield uh, good smelling formulas, right, and kind of narrow that list down for then a human to now take over. But you see, this is where the power of AI is, and a good example of what it can do, it can ingest and digest uh, that tremendous data set that a human possible just can't possibly do, right? It's right. impossible. And so, well, you know, you mentioned you mentioned the professional smeller, right? And I have a friend who um, his daughter was a sommelier, and he gave us the test kit that she used as a sommelier to learn this. And there are literally you know, seventy five vials in this test kit, and wow. you open them up and you smell it, and you guess what it is, and then you go look at the test kit and see if it's really what you smell. It's hard. Um, yeah. but, but the human nose can be trained on things like that. Um, we're a long way from AI being able to, to actually smell something, right? It's just using a mathematical calculation to say, if I had these 20 chemicals, uh, I get something that a human told me was good. Yes. Um, and, and then it's making approximations and guesses to say, okay, well, if these, plus, if right. all these together smelled good and all these together smelled good, maybe I can mix those up and still get something that smells good or and remember, whatever, right? Also, the opposite, these combinations, when put together, smell bad, mm -hmm. right? So it can then start to, like you said, then make those statistical uh, uh, predictions about what might be a good formula and which ones to stay away from. Right, right. Um, I think we can round this out by talking about two very common examples that are like right front and center in our worlds and our lives right now that we're super comfortable with, right? Um, so the first is a chat bot. Right, we all know about chatbots. They've been around a while, um, and I use but, a four-letter word every time I find one. <laughs> um, uh, do they get insulted? Uh, did you hurt I, their? Feelings? I don't care. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> there's no feelings for it for you yeah. to hurt. Uh, but this there is, may be this is one of those places where we'd like to see AI be a little better, right? They yeah. exist and they function, yeah. right? Yeah. But they don't quite give us the output that we want. And yeah. this is where it, this is where the growth guess, opportunity is. I can envision a checkbox on the back end, like enable salty version, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> Spicy enable, customer detecting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Enable Alex Farling mode. No, I'm only kidding, buddy. Um, so, but a chat bot, right? How does mm -hmm. that understand like what it is that you're, um, uh, you know, you're saying in your inquiries, right? And it's all based on uh, somebody feeding it super large amounts of, uh, data prior to those con about prior conversations so that it can interact with humans to generate very lifelike interactions. Again, it's this mimicry. And some people look at that stuff and say, wow, this is super creepy. Um, but it just is like, it's just this slick programming with lots and lots of data uh, and its ability, like you said, to make predictions, which is why also sometimes in these chatbot conversations, you get some kind of strange answers Right. Uh, or or just like half half baked ones. But it's um, not a very big leap from a chat bot to somebody like Grammarly, who's actually been doing this for over a decade, um, who claims right. to have like the you know the biggest data set on the planet around how people write and is able to use AI to to string together what good writing versus bad writing looks like and maybe when you sound a little too much like Alex and maybe you should sound a little more like Robert. Um uh, you know, and maybe you've got a little too spicy with the chat bot yeah. and you need to chill it out. Right? Yeah. Um, I think, uh, I hold back on my spiciness, maybe a little bit more than you do, but I'm, reality, I'm unfiltered, my friend, <laughs> I know you are, but, uh, <laughs> authentically unfiltered, uh, when I'm not, when I'm off camera, I can be super, super, <laughs> super 
bewildered. Um, but um, uh, it's it's interesting how you mentioned Grammarly because another uh, application that probably many MSPs, especially those that have uh, attorneys or lawyers as clients, know or remember Dragon Naturally Speaking, right? And that oh, was yeah. the thing. Yeah, I forgot about that one. And, you know, and I remember a specific, I've got this just, I don't know, this one client that I just can't get his image out of my head that he used to sit there with the boom mic. And this is going back, I don't know, like 15 years ago or maybe even longer. And I remember him sitting there and training it, right? And now it dawned on me now that I'm a student of AI to understand what it was doing then. It was asking for input from him to speak words and then to like all, like to help correct it so that well, it could I had that learn. Customer and you just gave me that epiphany. So today I learned that that's what my customer was doing with Dragon Naturally Speaking. God, what? this had to be 2008, 2009. Yeah. Like it was a long time ago. Way yeah. long time ago, right? Wow. And that's what it was doing. It was feed, you were training the AI. Feeding it the data set, Dragon. yeah. You were giving it the data set that it needed because out of the box, Amazing. it was like, hey, I'm just a stupid, like, I don't know anything. So, you, I mean, I think it had some data built into it, but True. it needed to be personalized for the person that it was interacting with. The same um, way we need to personalize today's large language models are GPTs and things like that, right? You know, we, we work with this in marketing and you go go have your, your GPT write out a marketing post for you. And it sounds like a movie trailer, right? In the world of yeah. cybersecurity <laughs> and in the realm of cybersecurity in 2022. Yeah. And it, it just says all the stuff that you could never hear yourself saying right, until right. you train it on, on who you are and how you speak. And then before you know it, it, it pulls out the movie theater stuff and starts to put in the, the authentic stuff and sound a little more chill and a little more like the person who, who it's probably supposed to mimic. Um, yep. So we see that with the large data model kind of leaning towards the extravagant um, and the customized and fine tuned. And I was working with a marketer the other day who showed me their version and they're like, yeah, watch, I, you know, I have a generic one, help me figure all this out. And then I go feed it to the, to the customized one. And now it comes out sounding like me. And mm -hmm. I watched her post something the other day and the post went through the roof on social media. Everybody loved it. It was exactly on message. It was exactly on tone. It, it got it exactly right because Perfect. she spent some time refining her, her personal GPT to sound like her. Wow. That's amazing. That's, but, I, that, but that's what AI is and is becoming, right? It, it is what it, with. it actually already is there, but it's becoming because we're starting to use it in the ways that it was intended to be used, right? It's, it's becoming uh, easier I, to screen and faster to get up to speed and things like that. Yep. 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 So, uh, but it was and funny. I'm still a super Luddite. So I was amazed by this and I went, Oh my God, that's so cool. But, uh, but <laughs> it is. smarter it's people cool. than me are like, I've been doing that for years, uh, or for a year. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's, it's really neat to watch. It's really neat to see. So it's funny when you, uh, your, I mean, your voice is naturally, you know, like, you know, it's, it's not squeaky or high pitched by any stretch, but how your voice got very baritone before when you were, uh, regurgitating what chat GPT told you, or, <laughs> um, I just, I kind of laughed at that. Um, well, because as soon as somebody said to me, chat GPT speaks like the, the movie, um, uh, the movie clip, um, or like a movie trailer, I can't yeah. see it. So now every time I read ChatGPT, that voice goes off in my head. And well, that's what I mean. It's like we're yeah. we're we're overly. And maybe this is where we're crossing the line a little bit. Is like we're personifying this technology, and again yeah. because it's good at mimicry, right? It's yeah. mimicking. That's all it is. Um, uh, it's almost like a parrot, right? Like you hear well, about in that in that case, it's mimicking things that it knows get people's attention. Right. Write me a social media post. Okay. I know people yeah. get excited about a movie trailer. So I'll use that tone and that, in, in, yes. you know, that kind of intent. And yes. so it mimics the things that it think is, thinks is going to bring interest. But without data, it would not have known to do that. Right. And so right. that's hundred percent. So this brings me to my second example. We talked about chat bots. That was kind of the first example. The second one is uh, image uh, recognition, right? To be able uh, to get a to have a tool that can learn and identify and describe objects and images by reviewing millions of prior pictures. Um, so if you think about like the human face, right? Or uh, uh, there's uh, we'll probably talk about in an upcoming episode around uh, some awesome technology that John Deere had invested in that can help um, uh, tractors, farmers. Um, with AI enabled cameras to discern between a good crop and a weed, right? And the only way that that works Amazing. Is, is by feeding it just these enormous data sets to say, this is what a weed looks like. And this is what a, a good crop that I don't want to spray with herbicide 
uh, looks and, like, right? So and we, think that's, yeah, simple. we right. think that's so simple, but I think back to how many times I had to swipe my finger on my iPad mini before it knew all the, all the parts of my finger that would let me log yep. in. And then yep. we think about all the angles that it has to be able to identify a weed from as a tractor just drives over it. So they do, they totally. have to feed it an enormous data set. It's not just here's, here's a clover, here's a corn cob. You know, th these are not the same thing. Kill one, not the other. It's, it's got to yeah. know every single piece of that to figure that out. So those are the two most common examples of how AI uh, is used, or at least the ones that I, in my opinion, my humble opinion is things that I found that uh, seem to be uh, pretty widespread, right? And and even I'm able to unlock my phone by looking at it, right? Uh, because of that facial recognition. Uh, and it's amazing because I remember when that first came out, how terrible it was and how many times I almost wanted to smash my phone against the flat surface of a table uh, yeah. or the yeah. sidewalk um, uh, and stomp on it. But now it's and like- it can identify you in the dark with sunglasses yeah. on, right? And I was about to say that, like there have been times where like I go to like look at my phone in the middle of the night because I heard it go off or something or just go to check the time and it recognized my face in, the pitch, in pitch black. Like what? Like how did it know it was me? Um, yeah. Anyway, so uh, I think that kind of rounds out this conversation around, you know, what it is and what AI is, what it's not. And uh, let's just shake off the, you know, those fears about uh, or, or the, 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 the misinformation that I think that we get from uh, television, right? Let's look at movies that we know that are about, uh, any, you know, prior to AI really becoming uh, prevalent and say like, that's not the way computers work. Like you can't do that. Like it, that's not the way a firewall works. Uh, and you know, suddenly in this movie, there's all the sensational stuff that comes out. And unfortunately that's driving uh, public opinion and many of us, uh, and I'm not talking about just MSPs. I'm just talking about humans in general, uh, or maybe this is a, a problem or a phenomenon here in the United States, we tend to get our education from social media and from television. And that's where I think the real danger lies. Well, I think there's a message there for the MSP, right? You're the, you're the trusted advisor for your customer. Hopefully you've become that. Um, when they start to take on some of this sensationalized um, idea of AI, it's our job to go help them unpack it, to go show them yeah. what reality is versus, um, you know, versus, Versus TV, you know, hey, yes, yeah. you can you can call your phone from your, your car from your watch now if you have exactly the right car and exactly the right watch. But it is not uh, it, we're not to a point of um, even war games or, uh, or, or, you know, Tony Stark. Um, that's just not the world that we live in, even with the AI that we have. But good questions, Mr. Customer. And let's talk about how you can use AI in your business and how we can use these technologies or at least look to use them in the near future as they continue to get refined and better. Um, so that you can use them to grow the business, to, to make your folks more productive, more efficient, things like that. Well said, Alex. Um, I hope uh, that we've been able to cover this topic of what, I, what AI is and what it is not. I'm pretty sure that we've uh, pretty much exhausted everything that there is to talk about this for now, uh, but it does cue us up for some future episodes uh, on a wide variety of different topics. We'll be going into each one of these uh, topics uh, in much greater depth. Uh, any final parting thoughts or words, Alex? I think I've exhausted this one. I don't think I have any words left, which is weird for me. <laughs> uh, maybe we should ask ChatGPT to help us. No, 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 no. We, we don't need to do that. Uh, no, nope, I think it means it's time to put a pin in this one. Yeah, there, there's, there's still uh, time and place for us humans as well. So thanks for joining us and stay tuned for the next episode. We'll see you on the next one. This podcast was created by me, Alex Farling, and my good friend, Robert Chaffee. This podcast is produced by Francis Bellin. The music and artwork for this series were produced by Artificial Intelligence and edited by Francis Bellin.